Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, the tragedy of Grenfell Tower has all but blotted out the post-election turmoil, delaying any deal negotiations between the Tories and the DUP to prop up Theresa May. Nor does the shape of the impending Brexit negotiations punch through the still unfolding story of the fire. In fact, it's hard to focus on the fact that there was a general election exactly a week ago. But now there are extraordinary details emerging of the way that election was played or rather misplayed by Theresa May and her now sacked and discredited lieutenants. Our political editor, Nick Watt, is back. Nick. Well, the negotiations between the government and the DUP are still ongoing. The Prime Minister and Arlene Foster, the leader of the DUP, took a step back yesterday after the fire, but their, uh, their teams are still talking. My impression is that Downing Street can be confident that the DUP will support the Queen's speech, and that was why they were able to announce that the Queen's speech will take place next Wednesday. But they're not there on the second part of a confidence and supply deal, support for supply, support for a budget. Mm -hmm. uh, the Treasury is asking difficult questions, but then that's the Treasury's job to to ask difficult questions. Now, the reason why Theresa May is having to talk to a party with just 10 MPs is because her election gamble failed. So I have spent the last few days just trying to work out what exactly happened in that election campaign. She was Britain's new Iron Lady, who would deliver the will of the people on Brexit. Threats against Britain have been issued by... And the tackled deep injustices overlooked by generations of political leaders. And then, against the better instincts of this most cautious politician, she took the gamble of her life and failed. You stepping down, Mrs. Gray. Clearly, this was a catastrophe of a campaign. She'd given people a choice, and but then told them to choose her, and then hid. It makes you come across as not straightforward, not honest, not, not strong and stable. Theresa May has apologised to Tory MPs, who believe that the Prime Minister and her tiny, and now former, circle of advisers threw away this election. In the finest tradition, a blame game is now underway. Insiders who toiled away here at Tory HQ have identified two fundamental flaws with the campaign. There was no clear line of authority between the main figures. The Prime Minister's Joint Chiefs of Staff, Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill, and the Australian polling guru, Sir Linton Crosby. And then there was what has been described as complacency. The number 10 inner circle never feared they would lose this election, and so they never took Jeremy Corbyn seriously. After a less than friendly welcome, the defining moment of the campaign came in the wake of the manifesto launch. Within days, Theresa May was forced to embark on a hasty U-turn over the central pledge, the so-called dementia tax. Newsnight understands that the two cabinet ministers with responsibility for social care, Jeremy Hunt and Sajid Javid, were only informed of the policy in the 24 hours before the launch of the manifesto. Instead, the social care section drew on initial work for a green paper led by the cabinet office minister, Ben Gummer, who co-authored the manifesto. I've been told that other cabinet ministers were consulted extensively on those parts of the manifesto related to their briefs. But ministers were only given a copy of the whole manifesto shortly before the launch and around 20 minutes before the media. Even the head of the Prime Minister's policy board wasn't consulted. I wouldn't expect necessarily in a snap election it gets signed off by cabinet and it goes through a series of negotiations presumably and discussions. So I, I wouldn't expect to be holding the pen uh, on the last draft, but I didn't see any draft. And I think there was a culture in the campaign of we, the five or six of us, are going to do this. There was this uh, huge policy at the heart of the manifesto on the very controversial issue of social care and how to fund it, uh, an issue obviously fraught with political risk, which they did, did, don't seem to have sense checked in research, they don't seem to have squared people in the party and, and certainly um, it landed like an like a unexploded bomb right in the Tory heartland. 
Well, I think people were looking for a middle way, and there must be a middle way between the Corbyn approach, which was, here's the cookie, cookie jar, kids, help yourself, the rich will pay, and our prospectus, which was, we'll take your kids' school meals away, which we had to explain wasn't the case, and, and we'll take your grandparents' house away, uh, which also really wasn't the case. I closed the last page and sort of felt this kind of sinking feeling of, now a manifesto is supposed to offer hope and a sense of a brighter future to people. And this does none of the above. I mean, it just literally, literally tells people, you know, your life is going to be really bad if you, if you vote for this manifesto. Within days of the manifesto launch, an irritated prime minister said that a cap would be introduced. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. This had featured in early work for the Green Paper, but was not included in the manifesto because it hadn't been finalised. It turned out that voters were so confused, they asked Labour candidates to explain the Tory policy. It was a bizarre situation. We had Conservative voters asking me to explain to them what these changes meant. So people were really worried both about how they were going to heat and whether they'd be able to keep their homes. Members of Theresa May's inner circle feel deeply bruised by the fallout over the manifesto. On social care, they say the Prime Minister was simply motivated by fairness. Why should a young person living in the North subsidise the care costs of a pensioner living in the South in a house worth a million pounds? It's a choice between strong and stable leadership under the Conservatives. One of the curious aspects of this campaign was the disappearing act performed by one of the central messages. Theresa May's strong and stable leadership. The strong and stable thing worked for about two days and resonated for about two days. Then people were just sick of it because it was literally repeated ad nauseum. I don't know uh, when that was dropped. I certainly know that within our local campaign we, we dropped saying it very quickly because of the reaction we got and I think that was probably the way it was dropped around the country by other candidates at the election as well. Beautiful day in London today. Linton Crosby was the author of this message and is also blamed for the highly personal attacks on Jeremy Corbyn. I'm surprised that idea. This dismayed one of the architects of the Tory modernisation project. There was a sort of attempt to a character assassination which was I think quite likely to do what it did, which was to repel far more people than it attracted. Linton Crosby has told friends of his frustration with the campaign, but one old friend thinks he will recover. You win some and you lose some. Um, that shouldn't affect his reputation at all. There are all sorts of factors that play into whether you win or lose an election. For what he does, um, you know, he doesn't make the speeches, um, he doesn't... Um, uh, you know, choose the shadow cabinet or the cabinet or whatever it is. He does, he's not involved in that, that side of it. For what he does, um, he does that uh, pretty professionally. But, you know, it's no, no guarantee that you're always going to win an election. My government, my government, Theresa May is now fighting to keep the Tories in office and avoid another election. Amid widespread agreement among her MPs that she needs to stand down before then, one senior figure says the party should develop a more positive outlook with an emphasis on schools and skills. I think this very narrow, shrill, divisive, partisan insistence that Brexit was everything, and quite a hard Brexit message. And I think people started to think, if that's the Conservative Party, if, if it thinks that everything will be solved by Brexit, it really isn't in tune with us. And I think the campaign let Theresa May down terribly. That inspiring speech on the steps of Number 10 last year received huge approval across the country. A campaign reflecting that message, I think, would have had a very different result. Theresa May had thought that by now she would be settling back into Downing Street with an emphatic electoral mandate. Instead, the legacy of her troubled campaign is a new life as the surprise leader of a minority government endless negotiations with a minor party and even factions within her own cabinet to ensure the survival of her government. Nick, what? I've been